right, all right. How you guys doing? You doing all right? Some of you guys are like, is that the Eurythmics? Did I just hear the Eurythmics in church? Some of you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. Consider yourself blessed. All right, so it's nice to have you here. If we haven't met face to face yet, my name's uh, Greg Hintz, pastor here, lead pastor of the Place Church. We're so honored and blessed to have you here today. Uh, you know, this church body, it's a community, just a community of faith, people coming together on a journey. And I said, the beautiful thing about this journey is that we're all on it. And like a journey, like a trail, like a path, there's some people that are further along and there's some people that aren't where we are yet. But listen, we respect one another for the journey that we're all on. And if I see someone that's not there, I want to be reaching back. I want to be helping them move forward. If I see someone that's further along the journey, I want to learn from them and I want to follow them. And that's where it is. So I don't know where you are in your faith walk today, but wherever you are, I want you to let you know that's okay. All right? Because that's a great place to start. And the fact that you walked through those doors this morning and you're sitting in those seats today, that tells me that there's a hunger in your life for, for God. There's a hunger in your life for something more, and there's no better place to be. And this sermon series has been a great series dealing with life and where we are. It's called Sweet Dreams. And we're talking about things that keep you up at night. And we've talked about anxiety, and we've talked about different, different stuff. But today I want to talk about a different subject. I want to talk today about the subject of regret. Say regret. Now, there's things that people regret. And let me tell you, I talk to a lot of people. And the interesting thing is that when I hear about regret, I hear lots of different things. But there's been one common theme that I've heard a lot, and it's made a lot of laughter, a lot of good times, and a lot of, well, let's just say regretful memories. And they all have to do, some of them, uh, these ones that I'm referring to right now, they have to do with the subject of tattoos, regrettable tattoos. You know, the interesting thing about tattoos, they don't go away, right? And sometimes, you know, I don't know what people think sometimes, but maybe they think that they can wash them off, but they can't. They're, they're there, you know, and the next morning you kind of wake up with it and you begin to look down and you think to yourself, and sometimes it may take more than a day. Sometimes a couple years back, you get a little bit more wisdom and you look back at some of the things that you did and you may think to yourself, I wonder if anybody told him. Do you guys see anything wrong with that tattoo right there? <laughs> yeah, you're missing the apostrophe, right? I mean, that's a conjunction. That's you are next, not your next. And, uh, but, you know, maybe that tells a little bit about him. You know, sometimes we get a tattoo and we think, you know, that's going to be the greatest thing ever. And sometimes it's a high point. It's a great moment in our life. Like, like this next guy, he had just won the checker championship in his town. I mean, there were three rounds, and he worked really hard, but he won the checker championship. And he said, you know what I need to do to remember this moment in my life? I need to get a tattoo. <laughs> Man, you want to talk about a regrettable tattoo. That's, that's this one right here. Now, and, and the, my last one I'm going to show you, a lot of people, look at this. In fact, people came and says, man, this is an incredibly regrettable tattoo. But I got to tell you, this tattoo that you're about to see is the most beautiful tattoo in the world. It's the greatest thing. I can't even believe that I didn't think of this myself. And it's this tattoo right here. Only Judy can judge me. That's right, a Judge Judy tattoo. I thought I was a fan, right? This guy took it to a whole new level, man. He's at a whole nother atmosphere. He could definitely have lunch with Judy after getting her tattooed on him. Well, there's regrettable things. And sometimes we can look at tattoos and that can be funny. But for many of us, we understand regret. And if you don't really understand what it is, it's this. Sorrow aroused by circumstances beyond one's control or power to repair. And so we find ourselves in a place of regret. In fact, let me ask you, what is something that you or someone you know regrets? I'll give you the chance to answer. Other than tattoos, because we've already covered that. What do you think of a regret someone would have? Marriages, good, marriages. Maybe I regret that, okay. Say it again. 
Addiction, good. I not, wish I wouldn't have gone down that road or done that that first time. Find yourself hooked. I regret that season of my life. What else? Misbehavior. Misbehavior. That's right. What else? Job choice. Job choice. All right. Maybe there's some regret there. What else? Risk, risk that you didn't take. Ooh, interesting. Risk that you didn't take. Regret. Good. Can I get one more? <laughs> the wrong car. I had that with the Cadillac Katera, but that's for another story, all right? I understand that, you know, this idea of wanting the wrong car. But, you know, when you look at regret, regret comes lots of different ways, right? I mean, regret, I mean, we heard about relationships, jobs, maybe decisions that we've made, things that we've gone through in our life. And I think, you know, even when I look back at at my life, and we have an opportunity to do this sometimes, right? I mean, we begin to look in the rear view mirror. We begin to look back. And we look at maybe seasons, decisions, things that we did that we regret, that if we look back, man, I wish I would have done that differently, or I wish I wouldn't have done that which I did. I mean, I can go all the way back. I think about my teenage years. Some of you guys think about your teenage years, and you think about some regrets that you have, some decisions that you made, some bridges that you burnt, some people that you hurt, maybe for some of us how we treated our parents. I mean, I think about that, you know, and I, I regret some of that. And, you know, my parents are gone. I, I can't take any of that back. But we often find ourselves looking back saying, man, I wish that I wouldn't have done that. I remember even into my adulthood years, and here's the interesting thing about regret, even after you become a Christian, you can do things that you regret. I still, and I've talked about it, so I won't tell you too much, but if you've been around for a while, I talk about a defining moment in my life when I sat down at a table with about 10 different pastors. We were at a John Maxwell conference. They handed out a, a card, a, a deck of value cards with core values that people would have. And you had to go through them and pick out. You had to pick out 10, and then you had to pick out five out of those 10, and then three out of those five that would become your three main core values of your life. And all of us, all 11 of these pastors sitting around this table, we all had three in our hand, and we didn't show them yet, but then we were asked to lay them down in front of us. I laid them down in front of me. I mean, they were, of course, they were financial success, success, and something else linked with financial success, all right? I don't remember exactly what the value was, but definitely they were all about, you know, growing and, and, and expanding and, and making more money and having more influence. And, and then I looked around at all the other pastors around the table, and they all had one card, every single one of them, that I didn't have. And that card was family. And I remember looking at the cards around the table and then looking at my cards. And I got to tell you, in the midst of that moment, what I had in front of me wasn't as important as what I saw in front of other folks. And it's interesting because that reality had to shake me to say, what are going to be the priorities of my life? What are going to be the priorities that I choose to live by? And the interesting thing about that is that even as you find this lack of priorities of families, I mean, that caused me to, to not be a really good person, not really to treat people that great. You know, when I look at my relationship with my wife, I mean, early on, I wasn't a very good husband. And I look back because, see, the priorities in my life weren't the right thing. And so then I can look back at that season and look back at that place and say, I have to decide what I'm going to do with that. Now, see, what I've chosen and what I hope many of us will choose when we look at the subject of regret is say, you know what? That's something of someone that I don't want to be. And I'm going to allow the understanding of that behavior to change me and the person that I am today. See, some of you look back and man, there's some really dark places in your past, things that you really regret, things that follow you and hurt you even today, but you have to make a decision of what you're gonna do with that. You're gonna consistently look and live in that place or you're gonna say, man, I know something about me and I'm gonna work really hard today so that I can have a better tomorrow. See, that's the power of regret. I mean, that's what we can do with it, but we have to make that decision. 
And my hope today as we talk about regret through a biblical perspective is that we begin to really look and understand we have a choice to make. How are we going to choose to live our lives? How are we going to choose to live our tomorrows? Listen, we have regrets. We have things that happened in our life. We had roads that we went down, but we have to realize that these regrets that we have, they don't have to define us. We can learn from it, but they don't have to define the person that we are today. See, what we choose to do in the midst of regret. And oftentimes, we'll find that regret will have a common denominator. It's not always that which you did that you wish you didn't do. Sometimes it's those things that you still haven't taken the step to do. Like this little video. They set a chalkboard on a street in New York City. Let's see what happens. Can you turn up a little bit for me? I was afraid, <laughs> afraid I guess of failing maybe. I regret all the time I wasted, not saying yes to things. It's something I've always wanted to do since I was little. Time slipping away, I mean, that's probably the worst feeling in the world, right? I've got loads of friends from different walks of life and it's really hard to keep in touch with everyone. Up until recently, I was homeless. If I hadn't hurt the people that I had, maybe I wouldn't have been. I wanted to do so many things, but I can never seem to find the time. I did all the things that were like plan B. I just never did it. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. All right, y'all. Enjoy. Clean board feels feels like where I want to be. Feels like where I want to go. That it's not my regret anymore. It's hopeful. It means there's possibility. to think about that reality in our lives today. This idea that every day is a clean slate, that in the midst of this moment where you are right now, that you have the power to pick up, to start again, to become the person that you want to be, to begin to go down the path that we can look back and say, I wish I wouldn't, but we need to look in the present and say, but I am. Amen. We need to look at the present and say, who are you becoming today? Are you just going to continue to dig that rut? Or are you going to put yourself in a new position and say, I'm not going to be the person I was yesterday? I consistently say, we are working today for a better tomorrow because we're tired of the person that we were yesterday. We want to see life transformation, but it's only going to happen when we consciously make the decision to take a step forward. 
And a lot of us don't do that because of what we think God thinks of who we were or what we've done or what we haven't done. See, we come to the place where we feel like we've let God down and that thought stops us from taking a step forward. And in scripture today, I want to look at someone that we've talked about in the course of this series called Sweet Dreams. I want to talk about the Apostle Peter. Now, our very first week in this sermon series, we went to a letter that he had written, a letter called First Peter, and we looked at his advice. And we saw that his advice was to humble up. And we talked about the keys to humbling up and why that was important. And then we talked about his words as he said, cast your cares, cast your anxieties upon the Lord. And we talked about what that looked like, this idea of casting this fishing net and casting our cares and not having those things with us anymore. Well, the one thing we know about the Apostle Peter is that the Apostle Peter made a ton of Mistakes. Tell me something that Peter did that he may have regretted. <laughs> Everyone knew that. Yes, denied Christ. Can you tell me something else he may have? Stayed in the boat, right? Or got, yeah, exactly. Or got out the boat and almost went under, right? I mean, really was in a tough spot, but even stayed in his comfort zone, wouldn't get out, wouldn't step. What else? He cut off an ear, right? He pulled his sword out. Wha-cha! He went ninja on that guard, right? Just chopped off his ear. And Jesus is like, say what? He just put that ear back on, right? Healed him up. You guys are like, what are you talking about? And I would say, read your Bible. It's really awesome. <laughs> But what you have to know about everything that Peter did in his life, but especially that one that everyone chorus out, is that God already knew that Peter would regret something. God already knew before Peter did it that Peter was going to do something that he was going to regret. Now, you remember when Jesus looked at Peter, and we can read in the book of Luke chapter 22, and he says, before the rooster crows two times, you're going to deny me three times. Remember that? He he told him before it happened, he said, you are on the road right now to deny me. And he said, never, 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 I'm never going to deny you. He said, I would die for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, you're going to deny me. But here's what I want you to see, that just a couple verses before this verse right here, just a couple verses before Jesus tells him about that rooster, I want you to listen to the words of Jesus and what he told Peter. He looks at him and says, Simon, Simon. That's Peter, Simon Peter. This is his name. So he looks at him and says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. I want to stop there because, see, we just finished a sermon series called The Devil Declawed. And you guys are starting to see, man, it's, it's good for me to come to church every week because, see, we're building on something here. Your knowledge base is building and growing because when we talked about the devil, we talked about the verse John 10, 10. Remember that? And it was Jesus' words that he said, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember that? Now we're seeing it firsthand in the life of Peter. Jesus saying, Satan has come. He's demanded. He's come in and he's requested. He, He wants to do something in your life. He wants to destroy you. Wow, that goes key with John 10, 10, right? I mean, these two things line up back and forth, kill, steal, and destroy. Now, the interesting thing is I would say the same thing is true in our lives too, that the devil loves nothing better than to step in your life to steal, to kill, and to destroy our lives. And he went in and he's requesting that. He wants to. He's demanding that. He's called the accuser of the brethren, which means everything that you've done that you shouldn't have done, he's continually accusing you before the throne of God, the accuser of 
the brethren. But you got to hear this part. I want you to hear the part. What did Jesus say after that? He said, yes, he, Satan came, he, he demanded, he, he wants to sift you like wheat, he wants to take you out, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Isn't that beautiful? Think about that. Jesus says, I have prayed for you. Think about that in our life right now. Imagine this picture of the enemy just wanting to destroy you. And some of you look back at some of the regrets and some of the things that you've done, and it's, it's a miracle that you're breathing breath today. It's a miracle that you're still on earth because the enemy's goal was to destroy you. But Jesus has been praying for you. Jesus has been interceding for you. And he's been praying for your faith to be strong. Think about that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He wants your faith, this thing that you believe. Let me ask you in your life, is your faith strong today? Because Jesus is praying that your faith is strong so that when the enemy comes and strikes, your faith will rise up. That's how we fight the enemy, right? The faith rises up to fight the battle between good and evil in our life. Jesus is praying that your faith may rise up and make you strong so that you can stand against the enemy in your life. And here's what you have to see is that he already knows in the next breath, he's gonna say, but Peter, you're gonna deny me. Before the rooster crows twice, you're gonna deny me three times. That's in this discussion. But he's looking at him and saying, but I have interceded for you. I have prayed for you. And here's the last part that you have to see that's so important for us to see out of this. And when you have turned Again, he knows already he's going to fall. He knows already he's going to do something he's going to regret. But his prayer is when he should turn again, that he will strengthen his brothers. Even though he's going to make a mistake, even though he's going to mess up, even though he's literally going to deny God, deny that he knows God. I mean, to, to say I didn't even know who he was about Jesus, Jesus is God incarnate. He's going to deny God. God looks and Jesus, right, looks at him and says, but you're gonna turn and when you turn, I want you to strengthen your brothers. So when Jesus is looking at Peter, even though he already knows Peter's gonna make a big mistake, he's still saying, I still see you worthy as ministering to others. I still see you worthy of reaching into someone else's life. And I want your story, what you're going through, to strengthen your brothers. Now, what does that mean to you? What's stopping you? What's stopping you from truly living the life that God has for you? Maybe regret from the past, things that you did that you shouldn't have done, things that you didn't do that you wish you would have. And you look and say, it's too late for me. And Jesus looks at you and says, it's never too late for you. Peter already, Jesus already knew what Peter was going to do. And he already looks at him and says, I want you to take that regret that you're going to carry with you. And I want you to use it to strengthen others. Let me ask you, are you using the regrets in your past to strengthen others who are there in that place right now? Because let me tell you, the regrets that you've gone through, the things that you look back that, man, you, you just, you look back and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have. Is that your secret? Is that something that you're just keeping to yourself? Or is that something that you're opening up, pointing people to the goodness of God, but for the grace of God, you're alive today? Because you gotta know that God knew it all along. God already, he knows everything. You know, I mean, the, the, the beautiful picture in scripture that we get is that God is omniscient. What does that mean? It means that he knows Everything The Bible tells us that. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 literally says, God knows all things. When Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. Think about that. He says, not even a bird can fall to the ground and die without the father knowing. He knows all things. You look at your life and the mistakes that you made, and I want to let you know it didn't take God by surprise. God knew. 
He was with you when you were doing it. He was there. He was present. And that just made some of you guys shudder. And you're like, oh, man, I, I hope he wasn't there. Listen, he's omniscient, right? He knows all things. He's omnipresent. He is all places at all times. He was there in the midst of that moment inside of your life. You don't have to hide that from him. You don't have to keep that from him. And he is looking at you and saying, but will you use this story? Will you use it for his glory or will you just keep it all to yourself? You make that decision. You have to choose how you're going to live. When we look back at regrets, God has the power to use those regrets for his glory on this earth, but you got to take it and give it to him. you got to give it to him. you got to say, God, I'm sorry for this. Sorry for this mistake. I'm sorry for this thing that I went through, and I want to live my life to use this story for your glory on earth, but for the grace of God. You know, advice I give on a regular basis to folks, I look at them all the time and I say, failure is not in falling. Failure is in not getting back up. Too often in the Christian life, we equate failure to falling, but failure is that moment that you don't get back up. See, I would look at you and say, you know, fall down seven times, but rise Eight, And for some of you, it's you've fallen down 798 times, and I would say rise 799, right? And learn from what's making you continue to fall, what's making you to continue to go that route. See, there's something there. Why do you keep going in this same cycle? Why do you keep going in this same direction? Why do you keep going back to this empty well? thinking that somehow it's going to satisfy you when it hasn't satisfied you ever in your entire life? Why do you keep going back to relationships that are dead ends when you know they're just a repeat of the last 10 guys or the last 10 girls that you've had and it never works out? Why do you continue to go back to this addiction that holds you so tight and you don't want to go back there, but you continue to go back there? Why, why do you do that? Why do you continue to to get caught up in yourself forgetting the needs of the people around you because you just don't want to deal with the issues of your life and what you've gone through? Why do you continue in this cycle? See, God would look and say, it's time for that cycle to be broken. It's time for change to happen. It's time to turn over a new leaf and to begin a new direction. The last thing I want to share with you is just this. Before Peter denied Jesus. Before that happened, where, what garden was Jesus hanging out in? He was hanging out in this garden of Gethsemane, right? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these guards come and they grab Jesus. And what does Peter do? He lops off an ear. This is the incredible earmark that hopefully, yeah, earmark. Is it biblical? I don't know. You got to look that up. Google that later, maybe. Um, This is that incredible moment, right, is when this happens and Peter whacks off an ear and all this stuff happens. And I just want, want you to see where we find Peter after this moment. Now, mind you, this is right before he's going to deny him. You got to see this. It's in Matthew chapter 26, two verses, 57 and 58. Look at what happens. It says, then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. And I just want to point out one one verse there that really stood out to me. Describe Peter in the moments before he denies Jesus. It says that he was following Jesus at a distance. I just want you to think about those words. Just just for one moment this morning. Following at a distance. You know, sometimes regret in our life causes us to come to the place where we're going to follow Jesus, but we're following him at a distance. We don't want to get too close because of who we are and what we've done and the mistakes that we've made, And but if he knew the real me. And so, yeah, we're following him, but we're following him 
at a distance. I want to ask you in your life, and you don't have to answer this out loud, but within yourself, does this describe you? Have you made a decision to say yes to Jesus? I want God. I I want to follow after him. But when was the last time you really sought after him? When was the last time you opened up the word and, and, and opened up the Bible and you were just hungry to hear from him? When was the last time that happened? When was the last time you just shut off the TV and you shut off your phone and you just sincerely prayed and say, God, I just want more of you in my life. I, 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 just, I just wanna know what you want from me. I wanna follow you. I wanna do what you want. When was the last time that happened? See, because sometimes in our life, we, we as Christians, like we're, we're believers, we, we're gonna go to heaven one day, but then we look at our lives today and we say, are we living the life that God has? When was the last time you really got out of your comfort zone to follow after him? When was the last time you had to give of yourself in a way that you haven't given of yourself? When was the last time God made you uncomfortable? And if you look back and say, man, I can't remember the last time, maybe you Maybe you're following God at a distance. And I want to encourage you this morning, the days of following God at a distance are over. This moment today is your moment, your moment to make a decision to say, no more will I follow God at a distance. You know, I think about, I think about me, I got, a, I got four kids. I love them to death, right? I got, I got kids at every, every age. I got 18, right? He's getting ready to head out and, do his thing. I got 13, hallelujah. I got eight. And then I got a three-year-old. I got three older boys and then a little daughter. And so God's always reminding me of this process of, of growth and development and change. Sometimes I'll go out with my daughter and sometimes just me and her and we're hanging out and we'll go, we'll go to Safeway, right? We'll go to the grocery store. And the interesting thing about her is that I used to be able to lock her in a cart. It was, it was heavenly, right? Uh, but now she wants to walk everywhere. And she'll, she'll know we'll just pull in the parking lot. She'll already start pleading her case. She'll be like, walk, 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 walk. You know, I'm like, no, I'm going to put you in there because that way I know where you are. And, of course, she always gets over on me. And so she ends up walking, right? And I'm pushing the grocery cart around. And I'll be, I'll be in an aisle. And she'll, she just has her own agenda, you know, when she goes, I don't know if she has a list in her head or what she wants, but, you know, she'll stop and they position everything so it's right at her height. And so she's like comparing the goldfish crackers, like what flavor do I want to this week, you know? And she's looking at these different things and I'm like, come on, Juliana, come on, we gotta go, you know? And I'll start going down here and she'll just look at me. <laughs> I don't know if she even knows what that means yet, right? But that... Yeah, already doing three. And uh, I'm like, okay, we got to go. And I'll move a little bit further down the aisle, right? And I'll look back. I'm like, we got to (laughs) go. And she's like looking at her goldfish, right? She's like, do I want the graham cracker goldfish or the cheddar cheese goldfish? You know? Well, finally, I'll be like, well, you know what? (laughs) And and, and I'll, I'll go around the end of the aisle. Now, here's the interesting part. I'm at the end of the aisle, right? And, of course, I'm not letting her out of my eyesight, but she doesn't know that because I'm hiding behind the Cheetos. And uh, I'm just looking around the corner, and I'm looking at her. And she's engrossed in her goldfish, right? She's like, what goldfish? And then there's this moment. So if you've had kids, you know this moment where they realize that they're alone. They, she looks Her eyes get real big. She starts moving around. She drops the goldfish, right? She has no idea what she's going to do, where she's going to go. She just knows that I'm not there. And then it's in the midst of that moment I come out from behind the Cheetos. I told you to come. (laughs) And there's this moment where she sees me and she just takes off running, right? scoop her up in my arms, right? I'm just, I'm just holding her, and she's so relieved to see me. And, you know, I think about that example, and I think that's how God is with a lot of us. You know, what he wants in our life is for us to follow close, 
for us to hear from him and act in accordance to, as he directs us along life. Like he has a plan and he has a path for each of us. And so he's like, come, let's go this way. Let's go that way. His words weren't come lead me. His words were come follow me. And so he's calling us to follow him. In order to follow him, we have to stay close to him. Where is he leading us? Where does he want us to go? And then there's this moment where we're just stuck looking at goldfish crackers, where we're stuck doing our own thing, where we look at God and we're like, Pfft. some of you guys are like, that is totally what I do all the time to God. Because we're doing what we believe to be important, but here's what I want to challenge you with. God's behind the Cheetos of your life right now. And he's looking at you. And he's just waiting for that moment for you to realize, God, I need you in my life. I want to follow close. I, I don't want to follow at a distance. I want to be connected to you. And I promise you this, that moment that you drop the goldfish of your life, whatever that thing that you're connected to more than God, you drop that and the moment that you turn to him, he's going to pop out behind those Cheetos and you're going to see him and you're going to run and he's going to throw you in his arms and he's going to say these words, come follow me. I want to encourage you. Yeah, you got regrets. You got things that you, 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 you made some mistakes. You did some things. But listen, tomorrow is a new day. Today is the day that we have to move forward and follow after him. Lay down the goldfish. Look for him in your life. Follow him closely. Allow regret to be true. Make amends, make things right, and allow that which you've done to hurt others propel you forward to say, never do I want to be that person again. You see, God has a path for each of us. He has a direction that he wants us to go. And we're going to go get there when we follow close to him. Today is your day to make that decision. Let's pray. Can you bow your heads with me? God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for your love and your grace and the hope of a new day that you, God, have a plan and a purpose for each and every single one of us. And we can relate with the Julianas. We can relate with the distractions that we have. We can relate with being in a place where we're, we're not even looking for you because we just know that you're there. But when we look around and you're not there, we get scared. And there you are to say, I'm still here, son. I'm still here, daughter. I've never left you, nor will I ever leave you, nor will I ever forsake you because I love you and I have a plan and a purpose for your life. Listen, maybe you're in this place and you say, man, I've been, my life has been all about me. When I look at it, I'm consistently looking at the things that I think I want. But you know what? That road is getting me nowhere. Today is my day to turn to God. Today is my day to surrender. Today is my day to ask for forgiveness, to invite Jesus in. Today is my day of change. And if you're in that place right now, I want to say a simple prayer with you this morning. It's a prayer of turning from self and turning to Jesus. It's a prayer of surrender, opening your heart and opening up your life to him, saying, God, I, I wanna give you the rest, everything that I have, every breath that's all about you. And if that's you, in just a second, I'm gonna have you lift up your hand and we're gonna say a prayer. In fact, on the count of three, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, if you're ready to surrender all to him, I want you to lift your hand up high. Ready, one, two, three. Lift it up so I can see it. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Anyone else saying yes to Jesus today? Hands all over this place. Awesome. But we're going to pray with all those that lifted their hands up right now. And if you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with those that are praying it for the very first time. Say loud enough so that you can hear yourself speak. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my past, for my mistakes, for the things I regret. And I ask you to forgive me. Today, I turn to you and I run to you. And I believe that your plan is great for me. Help me hold on to it 
all the days of my life. Fill me with love, joy, peace, and a sense of purpose. Now let me pray for you. Father, I pray for each and every single person that's here today, Lord, as they turn to you, as they believe, Lord, that you lived, died, and rose again, as they believe, Lord, that your plan is perfect for their life, as they understand the weight and the gravity of their sin, Lord, and the stuff that has held them back, and today they turn to you. I just pray that your grace, your forgiveness, and your wholeness will come upon them. I pray that every single day they put you first. I pray that every single day they follow closely to you, and I just pray that you use them on this earth in great ways, the regrets, the things that had held them back. I pray that they become a story that they can use as they begin to share their life with others. And this story will begin to point people to you, Father. Thank you for the work that you're doing at the Place Church. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the hearts and the lives of the people that are here. And I just pray that this day and every day we can live for your glory because you are a good God filled with love and grace. Thank you, Father for what you've done. And thank you, God, for what you are doing today. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Will you give it up for all those that prayed that prayer?